Welcome to part two of Pathways of the Pioneers. Just like to recap from part one. We spoke about the characteristics of the early church and we spoke about the characteristics of the remnant church that they would be the same, that they'd have the faith of Jesus, they kept the commandments of God, they kept the Sabbath, believed in salvation by grace, they believed in baptism by immersion, they believed in the second coming, and they believed in the priesthood of believers. And the same characteristics we find in the remnant church. And we see that soon after the cross, apostasy came into the Christian world. We had tradition, purgatory, mass, baby baptism, rosary, immortality of the soul, Sunday worship. And we went to the time of the dark ages. And then God brought about the Reformation while the church was in the wilderness and eventually came out after 1844 the remnant church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. During that 1260 year period the papacy reigned, they brought about strange doctrines, persecution, they say between 50 to 100 million Protestants and faithful Christians were killed because they believed in the Bible and the truth. And today we find that the Catholic Church is getting stronger. We're told in the book of Revelation that though the, the beast received a deadly wound, it will be healed and that the whole world will wonder. And today we find ourselves in a situation where day by day the Catholic Church has and is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. Yet when we look amongst our own ranks, we seem to be becoming weaker and weaker and weaker and fragmented. Our focus has been taken off evangelism. Our focus is now on internal issues, politics, competitive sports, football. And these things have taken our focus off from evangelism. Also the evangelism that we are participating in is not of the blueprint. God saw fit to give Sister White visions on how to do evangelism. We have books like the book evangelism and gospel workers and the testimonies. But rather than follow these principles, we have gone after the principles of the world. And maybe this is one of the reasons why our, our work is not flourishing as it could and should be. The other thing I find is when we look at all our announcements, there don't seem to be that many evangelistic programs but I always find lots of gospel concerts so our whole focus has been taken into music and this is again another area we need to be very careful of. The rise of the great controversy. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world. Of the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption, he should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. So here we need to have an understanding of the theme of the great controversy. And this is why God saw fit to give us the book, The Great Controversy, as well as all the other four books that makes up the history of redemption. Sister White tells us that every single Adventist should have a copy of those books. The five books of the conflict of the ages and every single person in this world should have a copy of Great Controversy. Did you know that? Outside of the Bible, that is the book that should be pushed the hardest. The man of sin. The scenes connected with the working of the man of sin. Who's the man of sin? the papacy, the Pope, are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. So we see that the closing scenes of this earth's history are connected with the man of sin. This is why it's important that our focus should not be taken off the man of sin. In part one, we talked a little bit about how the Islam faith came into Bible prophecy and I believe there's more to play uh, as we go through the seven trumpets, especially in the seventh trumpet. But there's, there's new doctrines flying around in the church where 
uh, teachings are regarding the little horn power and the 1260 year period that this no longer applies to the papacy I don't know if you've come across this, these thoughts but these, these uh, uh, points on the 1260 and the little horn power now apply to the Islamic faith okay so these teachings is taking the heat of the papacy and moving it onto Islam but this is not correct we're told that the closing scenes are connected with the papacy so if you come across that that's why she says uh, repeat the history of the pioneers and we publish the works of the pioneers so that we're grounded in, in the pioneer foundational truths there is a work of sacred importance for ministers and people to do they are to study what? the history of the cause and people of God they are not to forget the past dealing of God with his people they are to revive and recount the truths that have come to seem of little value to those who do not know by personal experience of the power and brightness that accompanied them when they were first seen and understood in all their original freshness and power these truths are to be given to the world so how are we to give a message to the world if we don't understand or remembering what God has actually asked us to, to commit to the world it's a bit difficult isn't it, if I ask you go and do something but if, I, if I'm not telling you actually what you should be doing then how can you do the job God is calling you to do if you don't actually understand what you should be doing and actually understand the message that you should be given again and again I have been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts we are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat a last year's almanac. almanac the record is to be kept in mind for history will repeat itself so all the experiences that the pioneers went through will be repeated in our time when the third angel's message is preached as it should be power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence it must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins five of whom were wise and five foolish this power has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter for it has a special application to this time and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time just like the experiences they had during 1840 to 1844 we will go through the same experiences and, we, and if you remember in part one a great thing happened in the 11th of August 1840 can you remember what happened? the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and there was great emphasis and, and, and renewed interest in the day for year principle and a great revival took place in the proclamation of the first angel's message but we find some other events in history that have taken place the fall of communism in 1989 was a great landmark that was missed we find in the book of Daniel 11 chapter uh, verse 40 we see that there's the king of the north and the king of the south and there's a war and we find that the king of the north fights back and that is the, the, the story of the fall of communism in 1989 and it's a great history that we should start learning and studying about what's a loud voice? what would you say that something loud is? it's like a shout, it's strong isn't it? Temptations are being brought in by men who have been wrong in the truth. The truth that we received in 1841, 42, 43 and 44 are now to be studied and what? Proclaimed. The messages of the first, second and third angels will in the future be proclaimed with a soft voice? Loud voice. Are you presenting it in a loud voice? So often we say, them over there at Watford or Grantham they're not very loud but what about you here? are you loud? or are you quiet? they will be given with earnest what does earnest mean? with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit is this what you're going to do here? are you going to with a loud voice with earnestness and determination take this message? otherwise your church isn't going to grow here we see the 1843 chart 
On that chart in part one, I mentioned there was a 25, 20 year prophecy. Where does this come from? In Leviticus chapter 26, Moses sets forth the blessings and curses against Israel should they break the covenant. In the chapter, time prophecy set forth of how long the indignation of God against Israel will take place. Four times, Moses says it will be for 25-20 years. He symbolizes these 25-20 years by stating seven times. A time is a year, a year in the Bible is 360 days, so seven times or years will be 360 multiplied by seven, which equals 25-20 years. And this is one of the prophecies that William Miller was presenting. This is this pioneer foundational truth. I did this presentation at one church, and they thought, you've done away with the 2300 year prophecy. What's this new doctrine you're bringing in? This isn't new doctrine, this is foundational doctrine. This is what, uh, what the Millerites were teaching. The Millerites understood this time prophecy and portrayed it on the 1843 chart, which Sister White states was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. As a second biblical witness, the Millerites pointed out the seven times that passed over Nebuchadnezzar as an illustration of the 25-20 years of Leviticus 26. The seven times is mentioned four times Leviticus 26 and four times in the book of Daniel chapter 4. The Millerites did not however identify Daniel chapter 5 as a third illustration of this time prophecy, but it is for a many and tekel and yufasin represent both weights and monies. Whether you take the weight of the many and the many and tekel yufasin or their monetary value, the sum total of either is once again 2520. The message associated with many, many Tekel Yufasin is that the kingdom is divided, numbered and weighed in the balance and found wanting. Israel was numbered with time prophecies, divided into the northern and southern kingdoms, as well as literal and spiritual Israel, and they were weighed in the balances of the sanctuary, and therefore they reaped God's indignation for 25-20 years. They were chastised with God's indignation because of the self-exaltation that was also exhibited by Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. The Millerites had two minor problems with their calculation of the 25-20. First, Miller did not compute the year zero correctly, so when he started the 25-20 years in 677 BC, when Judah was carried into captivity, he concluded the prophecy in 1843. It actually ends in 1844. The other problem is that he did not recognize that Israel, the northern kingdom, was carried into captivity before Judah. In 2 Kings chapter 17 we have the record of the northern kingdom being carried away into captivity. This concept was then discovered by higher medicine. He believed that William Miller was incorrect with his calculation and that we should start the calculation from the captivity of Israel. In James Usher's chronology of the Bible, which is the chronology that Sister White almost exclusively referred to, states that the carrying away of the northern kingdom in 2 Kings 17 was the year 723 BC. So higher medicine says we should start that date and then add 25, 20 years to it. And what do you come up with? This means that the 2520 which begins for the northern kingdom in 723 ends in 1798. The 2520 for the southern kingdom began in 677 and ended in 1844. The 2520 time prophecy ties together both 1798 and 1844. So William Miller and Higher Medicine were both correct. So what's the relevance? So what? Is this just another fascinating fact that numbers add up? I don't think so. I then came across this statement in early writings, page 74, and it's a chapter entitled Gathering and Scattering. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, and their efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. So what time are we in? The gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God would heal and bind up his people. 
In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for examples to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, than he did then Israel would never be gathered. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures, so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those that gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced, and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844, and it will never again be a test. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord. But it must not be hung on time. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it, and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. So, pulling it together, we find that, that when we take the first prophecy, 723 BC to 1798, this is what basically we understand as a scattering time. The people of God were scattered. And then we find in 677 BC to 1844 is what we consider to be the gathering. So God is now establishing the time prophecy where he's going to start to gather his people. It's interesting, when you look at 1798 and 1844, there's a difference of 46 years. And we find that it took 46 years to form um, the, the rebuilding of the temple. In, I think it's the book of John. I thought I had the reference down. Yeah, chapter yeah chapter, uh, John chapter 2.20, it states that it took 14 six years to build the temple. But we find between 1790 and 1844 was another 46 years. So what, what we understand now is that God, after 46 years, was now establishing his new temple through his people, through God's denominated people. That's why it's quite important as we connect to 2520. Then we find in Daniel 8.13 and 8.14 Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary could not be cleansed until all God's Ten Commandments were being kept by God's denominated people. In our, uh, uh, after 1844, that's when the, the Sabbath truth came to its um, swelling. Before 1844, there was a few individuals keeping the Sabbath. But after 1844, God's people then accepted the Sabbath and now God's people were now keeping the Ten Commandments. Now God could start the process of the cleansing of, of the heavenly sanctuary. And basically what God is waiting for now is to have a complete and sanctified and purified church. Then he will come back. That's how I think the 2520s is, is bringing the importance of the 2300 day prophecy. God is preparing his gathered people to make an end of sin. In April 48, 1848, by train, by stagecoach, and by carriage, they came that April, Adventists from many towns and states. Their destination was the Belden home in Connecticut. 
Here, James and Ellen White, Joseph Bates, Brother Gurney, and almost 50 others met for what James White later referred to as the General Conference of the Sabbath-Keeping Adventists. This was the first of five such conferences held in 1848. With fasting and prayer, the pioneers studied the Word of God to know its teachings more clearly. They would often remain together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night praying for light in studying the Word. Again and again these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they may know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. James White, when he first became converted, he went out to do some preaching and it was an utter failure. He went back home, he got his 1843 chart, studied it for two weeks, learnt it, memorised it inside out, went out on a preaching tour and he converted thousands to the Holy Spirit. Thousands, because he studied his Bible, he knew and understood what truth was. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon Mrs. White and she would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages they had been studying would be given. The brethren knew that when not in vision, she could not understand these matters and they accepted as light, direct from heaven, the revelations given. This church is a prophetic movement. It was founded upon a prophet. We haven't got time to to address it today, but in the Bible, you have two types of prophets. You have scattering prophets, and you have gathering prophets. And at the beginning and end of a prophecy, you'd always have a prophet at the beginning of a time prophecy, and at the end of a time prophecy, you'd have another prophet. And when we go through the, the, the prophecies and all the prophets, we find at the end of 1844, we have a time prophet, Alan White. Thus light was given that helped to bring understanding of the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission and his priesthood. That small band of pioneers were encountering the challenge to let the message fly. There were three angels' messages. And today, those three angels' messages aren't too popular because one of them is, come out of her babble on my people. And that's basically saying, we have to go to the other churches and say, uh, you need to come out and join the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that's not very popular when we're in an age where all the churches are coming together in an ecumenical movement, and we're saying, actually, you need to come out. So it's not a very popular message that we have to give. And then we find, in Revelation 18, we have the fourth angel. What's the fourth angel saying? He's saying the same thing. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. But how would this handful of people tell the world about the truth? They were limited in funds, near poverty, They had already given all they had to the Advent movement. They had nothing left. The answer came from God in November 1848. The pioneers met at the Otis Nichols home in Dorchester, Massachusetts. They studied and prayed for direction in how to let others know of the truth. At that time, Ellen White was taken into vision. She was shown the world with streams of light encircling the world. This light came from the publications Sabbath Keeping Adventists were to print. After the vision, Ellen turned to James White and said, I have a message for you. You must begin to print a little paper and send it out to the people. Let it be small at first, but as the people read, they will send you means with which to print, and it will be success from the first. Here we see the importance of the literature work, the literature ministry. We're told that we need to get our publications like the leaves of autumn. James White's heart was stirred. For many months he tried to raise money to begin the paper, but none came. Now he looked out the hayfields. A year before he had mowed hay to earn money to travel to the Sabbath conferences. Perhaps in this way he could raise money to begin a paper. Interesting story with James White. He went out into the fields 
And some of the other workers laughed. They said, this guy is a minister. What does he know about farming? And they said, we, they, they, they placed bets, you know, how soon he will faint from the hard work. And they found after about an hour or so, James White was well ahead of them. And every so often they'd fall on the floor and then get up again. And whatever they did, they could not catch up with James White. And at the end of it, they, they said to James, we respect you, you know, you're some farmer. And they said, how did you do this? And we noticed you kept falling on the floor. He says, well, he says, every so often, I would pray to God to give me strength in my work. And he said, every time I, I, I got the, the mow, it seemed to just go that little bit further. Because there were heavenly angels just making it stretch a little bit further. And he got a lot more done. You know, that's a testimony in the workplace where, we, where we're all at. We can be faithful in our jobs and people will make note that there's something different about these people. James White started to walk the eight miles to the town of Middletown to buy a scythe so he can do some work. But before, but before he had gone too far, he was called back. Ellen was envisioned. She had an urgent message for her husband. She told him, The Lord showed me that he blessed you last year when you went out to mow, but that if you tried the same thing now, he would let you get sick. He doesn't want you to use your strength for ordinary work. What is God calling us to do? Does God want us to do ordinary work? Or has God called this church here, in this place, to do a special work? What are you going to do? Are you going to do ordinary work? Or are you going to do special work? Are you going to give ordinary literature out? Or are you going to give special literature out? These are the choices that we have to make. Your work is to write write and write and walk out by faith. James White began writing. Soon the manuscript for the first paper was finished. Now to print it. But how and where? James again set out to trudge the eight miles to Middletown. You know, these pioneers, they weren't weak. He could, you know, walking eight miles was nothing for him. To find a printer who would do the work on credit, he found the printer and the work began. The type was set and 1,000 copies of the present truth were printed. You know, Sister White tells, tells us that when we do our sermons and when we preach, what should we be preaching about and talking about? Present truth. And she said that it is present truth that will unite the brethren. Do we find unity amongst the brethren? Is it because we are presenting present truth? She says that when we emphasize and present present truth, the brethren will unite. The first present truth was in fact just a little paper, six inches by nine inches, eight pages in each copy. But it was the fruit of hearts bursting with the love for lost humanity. With tears of earnestness, James, Ellen and others knelt around the small bundle of papers and asked God to bless every copy. Then they folded, wrapped and addressed them to everyone they thought might read them. Maybe this is something when we do our outreach, we have a little publications, our Voice of Prophecy cards, maybe we can gather around and ask God to bless every single one of those cards or manuscripts or videos or DVDs that it will do a special work. James White, this man was not weak, I tell you. He's carrying it. James White, carrying the papers in a carpet bag, walked the eight miles to the post office. Soon he did the same with the second issue, then the third and the fourth. And as God had promised, letters came telling of blessings received, faith strengthened, courage renewed. Many letters contained money to help print more papers. You see, if you've got money, you need to put it to work. If there's a pile of books, or there's a pile of DVDs, or a pile of videos that need getting out, put your money to it, and get it out to the people. Because the time will come when we no longer have our books, our DVDs and our videos, and we'll be running for our lives. Soon the printer had been paid in full. James White received his receipt. September 3rd, 1849, received of Mr. James White, $64.50, for printing four numbers of the publication, Present Truth, being in payment in full of all demands to this date. Signed, Charles Pelton. You know, another principle is we need to get out of debt. If we're in debt, we need to pay it off. 
shun it like the plague, we're told. Light circling the world? Well, not yet. But the light was lit, and because it was God's light, it could not and would not be extinguished. Soon James White saw that the little flock of Sabbath-keeping Adventists needed a hymn book. He asked all those who had hymns to send them in. And in December 1849, he brought out this little hymnal. What's it called? Hymns for God's what? Peculiar people that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That was the shortest way he could say Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. <laughs> but doesn't that tell you something about our hymnal book? For God's peculiar people, they recognize that they were God's peculiar people. And you know, I said um, in part one, that ten years or so, the evangelicals and Catholics, they, they signed an agreement, evangelicals and Catholics together. And you know what else sprang from that? A common hymnal. Are you aware of that? You have, you have um, is it Spirit of Praise? Hymnal. Nearly all the ch- even the Catholic churches now have a Spirit of Praise hymnal. And now you can almost go into any church and you're literally singing from the same hymnal sheet. And today you don't really find the Baptist hymnal, Church of England hymnal, and Methodist hymnal because they've put those away and now you have a common hymnal. Not only that, is they've adopted using the projector style. So instead of having actually holding the book, we sing from the, from, the, from the screen. And I got chatting to one gentleman, he wanted to buy a projector. I said, why do you want to buy a projector? He says, well, I was trying to sell him a projector, but I was asking why you want to buy it. He says, well, so that I can clap. Because when I've got a hymnal in my hand, I can't clap. But as soon as I can see, see on the screen, I can clap. So it's all heading to a charismatic, charismatic movement. And now, even in some of our Adventist churches, you can, you can go to an Adventist church, and to a Methodist church, to a Baptist church, and there's no difference. Same worship, singing the same songs. And then we find, uh, with our choruses, um, let's put the hymnals down and let's have a, let's have a gospel session. Let's have a, you know, some rousing songs. But if you can't have rousing songs from your hymnal, then there's something wrong, isn't there? You know, we seem to put down our hymnal with, with these choruses that don't have any meaning, little love songs. You know, we need to wake up. Because this is why we had a hymnal for God's peculiar people. No musical notations were printed, just the words. The first hymn was the Holy Sabbath. The second hymn, Second Advent History. The hymns were distinctly... Adventists. You know, you find the odd hymn in the hymnal that, that, is, that are Catholic. There's that one, let us break bread together, together with our faces to the rising sun. That is a Catholic hymn. That is Babylon sun worship. It's not something that we should be singing. And there's another one that's um, ye watches and ye holy one. It's actually taken from the Magnificent, a prayer to Mary. So we need to, we need to go back to, to the hymns which have doctrinal sound truth in them. Ellen White had a vision about music. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me, will take place just before the close of probation. There will be shouting, with drums, music and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. So what, what, do, we, what do we gather from this? Just before the close of probation, Sister White is seen in our churches shouting. Have you ever seen any shouting in our churches? Drums. Have you ever seen any drums in our churches? Music. We see music in our churches, but what music? And dancing. Have you ever seen dancing in our churches? This is all before the close of probation. And I know there's a big debate, you know, in some of our churches whether to have drums or not to have drums. But the very fact that you've got drums in your church should not send you a signal that we're just right at the end of, of probation. The very fact you've got drums, whether you argue you play them for God or not, drums is a signal we're at the close of time. And what she says, the brethren will be so confused with this racket that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. 
We went to one church and, and, and they were on the drums and the drums were, were so bad they weren't even in sync with the hymns and it was just confusion. The other thing I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed as well, that the brethren who are really into the choruses and into the drum scene, they seem to have decided that they can dress casually. Have you, have you seen this? So you've got the elders, the pastors all in their suits, and then you have the, uh, the music leaders, the chorus leaders, the drummers, in jeans, in shirts with holes in them, no ties. So somehow this, this, this strange music is affecting the way we even dress. Our attitude towards God has changed by the very music we're listening to. And just in the same confusion in Daniel chapter 5, is it 4? Daniel chapter 4, when the three worthies were bowing down and had the strange music, today Satan is bringing strange music to confuse our minds. Those things which have been in the past will what? Will be in the future. Satan will make music, what? A snare by the way in which it is conducted. God's work is ever characterized by calmness and dignity. And this is the same in our preaching. Sometimes we see preachers, they're jumping up and down the pulpit, shouting and screaming. Um, sometimes, you know, when we pray, we pray in Pentecostals as if God is deaf. We are shouting at God as if He's deaf. God's not deaf. God wants a true heart prayer, true heart worship, not, you don't have to have jumping up and down, you know, there's a book that every pastor should read and every elder should read, it's called Testimonies to Ministers, you know, it tells you how our preaching should be, it tells you how our deportment should be, it tells us how our preaching style should be, not this acting and, and, and dramatized stuff. But just bear in mind that Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. And this is how we find celebration music coming into God's church. It is an attack on God's church. This is God's remnant church. And Satan is going to work his hardest to derail it. Eleven issues of the present truth were published in 1849 to 1850. Then in November 1850, at a conference in this house in Paris, Maine, the pioneers decided to change the name of the paper and enlarge it. Thus the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald began. It combined the truth about the Sabbath and the Second Advent with an emphasis on Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. It also contained articles on other biblical themes, letters from readers and notices, and reports from the few travelling Adventist ministers. The first, at first, the review was printed at a newspaper office, but in 1852, James White gathered funds to purchase a Washington hand press, similar to this one, and established our own printing press in Rochester, New York. In this way, Adventists would print their own paper and save money also. Many people accused James White of money-making. They said, you're in this for money. But, but James White and Ellen White, they were broke. Because every bit of money they had, they were put into the publication work, into supporting other ministers. They were penniless. Many personal sacrifices were made in those early days. One of those who gave all was Annie Smith. She died at the age of 27. Annie Smith died of a broken heart. You see, one of the things that God also has given us through Sister White is principles on courtship and marriage. There's a whole heap of information on courtship and marriage. And she tells us that less than one in a hundred, less than one, what's that? What's less than one in a hundred? That's less than one percent of Adventist marriages are approved of heaven. That's what she says. Less than one percent. So out of here, barely one couple, their marriage is approved of heaven. That's how serious the situation is in terms of courtship and marriage. And so God set forth a, an abundance of information on principles of courtship, when's the best age to get married, what you should look for in a woman, what you should look for in a man. And these principles, when carried out, will protect us. But so often we, we rush into a relationship, we shouldn't even be in a relationship. This is why we have this principle of courtship. Courtship is where we 
suss out the other person. Is this woman fitting the characteristics that God would have me? And is this man fitting the characteristics as God would have me? And during this time of courtship, you don't have physical, you're not dating, you're not kissing, you're, you're figuring out, are we compatible? Is this, are we right for one? Is God bringing us together? Can we give Bible studies together to someone? How do we, how do we fit when we go door to door? How do we fit when we're doing evangelistic programs? This is what courtship's about. It's not about having a nice time. But it's about, you know, is this the one God from, that God wants for me? So what are the things then that, that we should look for in a woman? Does anyone know? Well, when I was in my earlier years, uh, my brother, he, he put together, he compiled a document because he thought, I better keep him out of trouble. And I thought it was such a good book that we actually published it called Councils on Courtship and Marriage. And, and one of the things I did in my mind is I just had these kind of fences in my mind, these barriers. Because I found that as I tried around, is some of the sisters were kind of kind of flirt with me or, or kind of push themselves onto me. And, and what I'd find is, is that in my mind, I would have these little barriers. And, and if a sister could not meet these barriers, I would not even entertain the idea of courtship. I would not even entertain it. And I can't remember what the barriers are, but examples would be, how are they dressed? Are they dressed modestly? Um, how do they behave in Sabbath school? Were they, were they really diligent Bible students? Um, can they cook? What do they think about evangelism? Can they make good bread? You know, Sister White says, if a woman can't make good bread, you should think twice. You think twice about getting involved. It's true. This is how serious. Can you make good bread? You see, Sister White talks about restless modern eaves. They want to. They want to go off and do things without their husbands. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with, you know, in society for women working, but at least learn how to make... And mothers, are you teaching your, your daughters, your youngsters, how to make good bread? To sew? What about men? What about, and by the way, if a woman is flirting at you, you don't even want to consider her as a, as a woman to courtship. What kind of, what kind of woman is that to flirt on you? You don't have a woman that's chaste and, and discreet and modest. So what should you look for in a man? How does the man treat his mother? Does the man treat his mother nicely? Or the, the, is he always rude? How does the, has the man got a life work? How is he going to support you? Has he, has he got an income? Has he got skills that he can provide an income? Can he give a Bible study? Does he know his Bible? What does he think about God's truth? Whereas we tend to think of, she looks hot, or he looks cool, or he drives a nice car. These are some of the principles that we need, we need to find in courtship. Not whether they look nice. And, and let me tell you, if a man starts flirting with a woman, you don't want him either as, a, as, as someone to court. He should be chased. And Sister White, you know, Sister so White doesn't actually say it, but good principle is, she, well actually she does say, she says that before a man should call a girl, has he got the parent's permission? Has he got the parent's... So if any man comes to you and says, um, how about you and I getting together? Uh, you need to say to it, have you spoken to my dad yet? Or to my mother? You speak to my mum and dad first before you speak to me. That's how serious it is. How, how many girls do you know have said to a man, speak to my mum and dad first before you speak to me? I think probably, I can't count more than a handful that I know have done that. No, you need, to, you, need to get, you need to get the father's permission. And if you haven't got a father or a mother, you, 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 you say you speak to the elder or someone you trust. And you say, you speak to my elder first, and if he gives you permission, then I'll consider it. This is serious about course, And this is why she says less than 1% of marriage is approved of heaven. Because we don't follow the councils. This is how, how serious it is. So anyway, I'd have these little, these little barriers. And if the sisters didn't meet the barriers, I just did not entertain the idea. And, and, when, and when... I got a little bit stuck because when barriers did get met, I didn't know, oh, what do I do now? 
that these are here, these are, the, these are the, the hurdles that God gives you to protect you. And by the way, when, when we find in um, Ephesians, you always like to say that wives obey your husband, that's the famous verse where wives obey your husbands. But, but doesn't it say that husbands give yourselves, love your wives, give yourselves to your wives like Christ gave himself to the church? Who's doing the action, by the way? Who's doing the pursuing? The man. It's for the man to do the pursuing of the woman. It is for the man to initiate a courtship. It is for the man to say to the, to the mother or the father or the elder and say, Excuse me, sir, can I have permission to court your daughter? And if he says no, then you should you back off, you respect it. So, sisters, or would be sisters, maybe we're looking for would be courtships. If a boy comes to you and says, I want to go out with you, you know what to say now, don't you? You're going to say, have you spoken to my parents first? Anyway, poor Annie Smith, she died of a broken heart because the man led her astray. She got tuberculosis, got weak, got TB, and she died. But we can be thankful for the lovely poems which have been shared with us through the music of those pioneers. You know, she composed one hymn, and it was about Joseph Bates, James White, and J.N. Andrews. Do you know that one? I saw one weary. Yeah, that's about the pioneers. And she another, did another one, How Far From Home. How far from home are we? And his brothers, Uriah Smith, he sacrificed too, giving up his plans for a Harvard education. At the age of 23, in 1855, he became editor of the Review. For 50 years, he served as editor-in-chief, bookkeeper, manager, and even proofreader for the voice of the church. He also was the first Bible teacher for Battle Creek College, first secretary of the General Conference, and writer of many books, including Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation. Sister White tells us, by the way, that these books, she calls them God's helping hand. She also states that every Adventist should have a copy of these books. They weren't perfect, there were mistakes in the books, but they contain a lot of information which you can't get hold of today. Also, it contained a lot of the pioneer position on our doctrines and interpretations of our prophecies. Very powerful books. The whites, being young themselves, you see, this church was founded upon young people. The Whites, being young themselves, cared greatly for the youth. In 1852, James White started a youth instructor, a monthly magazine begun eight years before the name Seventh-day Adventist was even used. Those were years of great beginnings and great hardships. Often workers fell victim to disease, some died at a young age and were laid to rest here in the Mount Cemetery. Financial conditions were difficult. Some questioned whether the work could survive, let alone grow. Battle Creek, Michigan was God's way of solving the problem. Believers in Michigan invited the whites to move from Rochester to Battle Creek. The offer was gladly accepted. The Michigan Adventists quickly built a two-story building for the printing work. Generous men made this building possible. Cyrenia Smith, a blacksmith, J.P. Kellogg, a farmer and father of John Harvey Kellogg, these people, they sold their farms and put money into it. And the elder Kellogg sold his farm to raise money that was needed. One, one farmer, they needed a steam engine for the press. One farmer, he had two prize cows. And he really loved these cows. But he came, he came to James White and said, You know what? I'm going to sell my cows and give you the money. He sold the cows, gave the money, and they bought the steam press. And this brother, he said, you know, every time I hear that steam press going, that's my cows, that's my cows, you know. And, and it was faithful men like that that got the work going. So even if you've got a cow, you can do great wonders. Because of his two cows, great light went out into the world. Also in 1855, the Adventists built this little church building. This was one of the first two churches built by Adventists, the other being in Bucksbridge, New York. During the next few years, the membership grew rapidly to approximately 2,500 in 1860. But with such rapid growth, naturally comes problems. 
How should ministers be ordained? How should they be paid? What about disciplining wayward believers? How about dealing with dissident groups? How about dealing with with this general organization? How do we deal with the government? All these issues will come into effect. What do we do with donation money? If James White's receiving $50, who owns that money? How is it accounted for? Who owned the press? Some Adventist pioneers were against a formal organization, but Ellen White was given a vision in 1850 which revealed to her the order in heaven. She was also shown that there must be order to God's work on this earth. To provide for the support of the ministry, for carrying the work in new fields, for protecting both the churches and the ministry from unworthy members, for holding church property, for the publication of the truth through the presses, and for many other objects, organization was indispensable. In 1860, a group of leaders assembled in the Second Battle Creek Church and discussed the issue of organization. Some vigorously objected to giving the Advent movement a name. James Wright remarked, It seems to me that the child has now grown so big that it is exceedingly awkward to not have a name for it. After more discussion, a momentous resolution was adopted, resolved that we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. Sister White tells us later that God inspired this name. In fact, she says that this name is a rebuke to the Protestant churches because the seventh day emphasizes the Ten Commandments and the keeping of all the commandments of God and the Adventist is emphasizing the Second Coming. But today, we have in some of our churches this philosophy, let's take Seventh-day Adventist off and we'll call it something else. We'll call it something, something, community church. With little, maybe small, fine print, member of the Seventh-day Adventist church, because we are now de-emphasizing. It is not the best policy to strike out so blazingly. But we're told that this name is a rebuke and we should uphold it high. But it wasn't until May 1863 that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was organized. James White was enthusiastically nominated the first General Conference President, but he declined in order to remove any suspicion for his motives for church organization. How often are we hungry for church position? How hungry are we for church power? Here James was offered the presidency and he refused it because he knew people would use that as an accusation that he only did this to get power. He humbled himself so that the work would go forward. John Byington was elected as first General Conference President. Byington was a man of courage and dedication. At one time he helped southern slaves flee north to Canada. He had also been a circuit preacher for the Methodist Church. But how did John Byington become a Seventh-day Adventist? But in 1852 he became an Adventist through reading the Review and Herald. Again, the literature work. We're told that the publications are like silent preachers. They'll get into places that the pastor and the ministers and the Bible workers cannot get into. But the literature will. The literature ministry will make great grounds. And Sister White tells us there are certain books that need to get out. We're told the conflict of the Ages series. We're told that great controversy, ministry of healing, thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. These are books that need to go out with power. Yet today we find ourselves emphasizing other articles and other publications that the work of God is to push out the spirit of prophecy. Uriah Smith was selected that the secretary was selected the secretary of the General Conference. The new and large Review and Herald offices became the General Conference headquarters as well. So God has now formed the Seventh Adventist Church in 1862. So what now? What is the emphasis? How much truth has God given to Seventh Day Adventists? SDAs have in trust the greatest wealth of truth ever committed to mortals. 
Christ healed the people. And then to those whom he healed, and to those who had witnessed his healing, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. This is the work outlined before those who have entrusted the greatest wealth of truth ever committed to mortals. The question for us to answer is, are we willing to leave self out of the consideration? Are our energies spent in the Master's service? Are our voices often raised in earnest application for power from on high? Is our faith pure and strong? Have we put away all prejudice, all evil thinking and evil speaking? Are our affections set on things above? Or are they, then, or are they twined about the things on this earth? Are our eyes open to see the needs of those around us? Can God call us faithful watchmen? Is it necessary for Seventh-day Adventists to go to non-Seventh-day Adventists for further light on the present truth? The different parties of professed Advent believers have each a little truth, but God has given all these truths to His children who are being prepared for the day of God. He has also given them truths that none of these parties know. Neither will they understand. Things which are sealed up to them, the Lord is open to those who will see and are ready to understand. If God has any new light to communicate, He will let His chosen and beloved understand it, without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and in error. I make no apologies. We are told that the other churches constitute the fallen churches of Babylon. We have concepts like the Willow Creek, the Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life, Alpha Courses. These are coming from the Babylonian churches. Why are we getting involved with these things? There's no need. There is no light that we can gain from... When it comes to evangelism, we'd rather put our books down and say, what's Willow Creek doing? How come they have so many thousands of members? But there's a church in Korea, there's a church in Korea, and, and they went to this pastor and they said, how is it that your church is growing so big? He says, well, I studied two books, Book Evangelism and Gospel Workers. <coughs> non eventers are reading their own books and their churches are growing. Doesn't that tell us something? We have the light on nearly every single subject. We have the light on health, we have the light on education, we have the light on courtship, we have the light on family health, we have the light on publications. We have the light. The reason why we're struggling is because we've pulled away the pioneers, we've pulled away the testimonies, and we're saying we're in darkness. Where is the light? Oh, Willow Creek over there seems to be doing well. Let's go over there. We need to go back to our pioneer position, back to the Bible, and back to the spirit of prophecy. Should SDAs feel free to attend non-SDA religious meetings? You know, I, I think there's a, a, big, a big function down in the south, and, and, we, and so many times we invite non-Adventist speakers. Why are we inviting non-Adventist speakers? We should be teaching the non-Adventists how to preach, how to teach. I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings, for it is wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error that is a deadly poison to the soul and teach for doctrines the commandments of men. The influence of such gatherings is not good. If God has delivered us from such darkness and error, we should stand fast in the liberty wherewith He has set us free and rejoice in the truth. The, these statements are, aren't said in arrogance or we are superior. It is one of responsibility. With great light comes great responsibility and great burden and emphasis to share this light with those that are in darkness and error. Why are we going to these non-religious programs? The only motive we should go is to do evangelism there. Or if you've been asked to preach there. How does God feel when we listen to error? 
God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless he sends us to those meetings where error is enforced home to the people by the power of the will, he will not keep us. The angels cease their watchful care over us and we are left to the bufferings, the buffetings of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by him and the power of his evil angels and the light around us becomes contaminated with the darkness. You know, more and more Adventists are now are getting involved with the God Channel, watching the God Channel, watching Pentecostal preachers who don't understand Daniel and Revelation like we do, do not understand the truth like we do, and yet they're so hooked on these non-Adventist preachers. And what do we do? We listen to non-Adventist music with beats and drums that have no gospel message whatsoever. When Babylonian views are introduced, how should we respond? And when men standing in the position of leaders and teachers work under the power of spiritualistic ideas and sophistries, shall we keep silent for fear of injuring their influence while souls are being beguiled? Satan will use every advantage that we can obtain to cause souls to become beclouded and perplexed in regard to the work of the church, in regard to the word of God, and in regard to the words of warning which he has given through the testimonies of his spirit, to guard his little flock from the subtleties of the enemy. We need to be wise, we need to be delicate, we need to be faithful, we need to love our brothers and sisters, but sometimes a time comes when you need to say something. You need to say something in love. Sister White says, unless you prepare to die for that brother or sister, you don't have a right to say anything to them. You don't have a right to rebuke them. Only till your heart is right that you're willing to die for that person, are you ready to even say anything to those people. What is our accountability when we fail to reprove wrongs? We are responsible for the evil it produces. Those who have too little courage to reprove, you know, brethren, I, I speaking to myself here, it's so hard to have that kind of courage when you've got lots of people going one way and then you, you have a different idea. I, I was in an instance where um, a good, probably one or two hundred people wanted to, were quite happy to go down this particular thing. Even the main speaker was in agreement with this thing. And I felt like standing up and saying, what are we doing? We're in the last day, we're having a spiritual convocation. And we are we doing and you do this? You know, I was afraid to stand up and, and stand up against two hundred people. I was afraid to stand up against the high profile speaker and saying, What you're endorsing is wrong. But this is the kind of courage that God is looking for in people. Those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through indolence or lack of interest make no earnest effort to purify the family or the church of God are held accountable for the evil that may result from the neglect of duty. So God will hold me accountable for that day when I didn't stand up and say something. We are just as responsible for evils that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral authority as if the acts had been our own. You understand that huge responsibility. And so often we can, you know, there's people that will go on and this is wrong and this is wrong and you get tired. But you know, God may be speaking through them to, to say, look, I am crying, one crying in the wilderness. You are going down the wrong way. And though you've been a minority, sometimes we have to, you know, when you stand up and you speak strongly, you get less invitations sometimes. This happens. But what is God asking us to do? He's saying, we are called to make a difference. Read the writings of the pioneers. Why is this so important? The standard bearers who have fallen in death are to speak through the reprinting of their writings to bear their testimony as to what constitutes truth for this time. The history of the early experiences in the message will be a power, a what? A power to withstand the masterly ingenuity of Satan's deceptions. You see, today we have an Adventist football league. But yet we're told that competitive sports are designed by Satan. As the papacy is getting stronger, as the deadly wound is getting healed, as the evangelicals are about to push the Sunday law upon us, God's great massive army about to get ready for a football match. What are we doing? How many of us got involved with the World Cup? We're on the brink of a catastrophe and God's people 
are asleep. But we're told that as we look at the history, it will be a power to withstand the master ingenuity of Satan's deceptions. Repeat the words of the pioneers in our work. Who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure, and who laboured to lay the foundation of our work. You know, brothers and sisters, the remnant church was not ready to embark on its work at that time. It had a membership of about 3,000, its ministers were paid, its work was organised, but they were still only a handful of people. But what a task they faced. They had the whole world before them. They felt time was short. Do we feel time is short? They must let the message fly. They gave all. Are we going to give all? Are we going to give the three angels messages, brethren? Christ is about to come. Are we going to partake of football matches? Are we going to even support and endorse competitive games? Are we going to give wrong counsel when it comes to courtship and marriage? Are we going to say, oh that's nice, aren't they lovey-dovey? Or are you going to be stern and say, did he ask your father's permission? How does he treat his mother? Each of us, elder brothers and elder sisters, we have responsibilities for our youth to be a role model, to encourage them, to be an example, to train them. God is calling and waiting for people. Are you going to be part of that people?